He is a mighty God. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He is the sustainer of heaven and earth. He created everything by his powerful word and God sustains everything by his powerful word. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 that our God is able. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, far and above all that we could ever think or imagine. According to his power, his dunamis power, that is presently at work inside each and every child of God who has confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I welcome each and every person that's joining us on this platform tonight. We are very expectant. We are coming boldly before the throne of a gracious God. He is awesome. He is gracious. His grace is sufficient for each and every person that comes on this platform. In spite of your state, in spite of your weakness, you will be shown to be strong tonight. We are strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. We trust in Him. We depend on Him. Though we are many scattered in different places, in the name of Jesus, we are one body in Christ Jesus. He is in us. We are in Him. Do you know where Jesus is? The Bible tells us He is seated on His throne. He overcame the grave. He lived a sinless life. Right now, Jesus is seated on the throne as I welcome you. I welcome Pastor Lionel and the triumphant Christian church family. I welcome each and every person who regularly connects. I thank God for his presence. I can't welcome him because he's already here. The Bible tells us to each and every person, if you are a child of God, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He is here today. So as we gather, as we come in our different places and people connect, can we praise the Lord? Can you magnify the Lord with me? Let's exalt his name together. You can express your gratitude for what he has done. I know at times because of circumstances, it's hard to take out a word and say thank you. But as we look at certain Psalms today, we will look at Psalms of gratitude. And may those inspire you to be grateful in the name of Jesus. You can greet people that are joining. I welcome each and every person once again. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. As the song plays, that says hallelujah, which means praise God. Father, we praise you right now. And in Zulu, it says siabonga. Thank you, almighty God. You say, oh Father, through Paul, that you want us to be grateful in every circumstance and to give thanks in every circumstance. And right now, whatever circumstances different people in different homes might be going through, I thank you, Father, that they'll have a heart of gratitude in the name of Jesus. I thank you that the word that I will share will help them realize just how good you are and how merciful you are. I pray that you reveal the truth of your word. I pray that the powerful Rema word will rest on good ground. It will produce a fruit, a hundredfold return. I pray that you will touch lives, O oh God, and bring healing. Rest restoration and elevation in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Our God is a good God. He is worthy of all praise. I welcome you, Rihanna. I welcome you, Pastor Lionel. I welcome you, Tabia Mashtangu, Mr. Moyo. I welcome you. I'm just trying to look at the people that are here. We will start with a, a wonderful, wonderful psalm. It's Psalm 123. Psalm 123. I read. It's a song of ascent. These are songs that the children of Israel would sing as they climb up a mount going towards Jerusalem. And so each time they would sing these songs, I want you to just imagine how, what encouragement they got as we gather together. We're not going to a physical temple. The Bible tells us that that temple, when Jesus Christ came in, it seemed like there were a battle of two temples. We had the physical temple and we had Jesus Christ who they chased out of the synagogue. The religious leaders 
could not realize they could not see jesus the bible says in john chapter 1 verse 12 he came to his own but his own did not receive him but as many as received him he gave the right to become children of god jesus christ the word made flesh came here on earth he manifested his glory as he went about doing good casting out evil spirits healing those that were sick God was with him, the Bible tells us, and as he moved around in synagogue, synagogues, in temples where people gathered and met, you'd walk around in the marketplace, you would do it in the streets, in the villages, they saw a manifestation of God's glory. They saw God manifest his power. In the synagogues, when he preached, the religious leaders that had economic power, that had influence, political influence, could not stand him because he was a threat to their institution. And so right now in the mighty name of Jesus, I want you to know that when Jesus said to the leaders, listen, you can destroy, if you want to see a sign, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. He was not talking about the physical temple. He was talking about his body. He resurrected, overcame the grave. He died on the cross as a perfect substitute for each and every person who's on this platform who believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He did not only resurrect, he ascended on high, set on his throne, and that's where he is right now, ruling and reigning. Paul says we are seated with him on that throne, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. Far above the principality or the evil spirit that is trying to fight you. Far above every demon in hell that tries to rob you of God's best. Far above any enemy that hates you or any person that's gossiping or slandering against you. Far above the that's where Jesus Christ is seated. He's the head of the church. Not only triumphant Christian church. Not only kingdom ways church. Any denomination. Any church. It doesn't matter how many, how powerful the apostles are. How powerful the priests are. How powerful the prophets are. He's far above them. And tonight we gather together in different places. Yes, we might not be in a big amphitheater. We must not be, might not have a big band behind the scenes. But I'm telling you, heaven right now angels rejoice with us as we celebrate God they anticipate souls to be turned to God they anticipate lives to be transformed they expect a rebel sitarabaya they anticipate worried people and people that are anxious people that are stressed to be given hope they anticipate the kingdom of darkness to be depopulated as Josikayabaya as people turn to Christ as they come into the household of God God, as the prodigal sons and daughters come back to the house and the arms of God. I believe tonight angels are rejoicing. I believe tonight angels are ministering, stationed to minister on behalf of heirs of salvation. Those who were once separated from the commonwealth of Israel. Those who were once separated from the blessing that God bestowed upon Abraham and said, I will bless you and I will curse those that curse you, bless those that bless you. Through your name, Mrebos, through you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed and glory to God. Prophecy was fulfilled as countless as the stars. So are we as children of God scattered in different places from different ethnic groups, from different races from different color of skin we are we are scattered together in different places as the light and the salt empowered by the very presence of God Dunamis power is at work tonight the power to heal is at work tonight the power to deliver is at work tonight the power to transform he is at work tonight he has a name he has a name his name is Jesus you might know and he's moving in our midst today as the song says, move in this place, Waymaker. Move in this place, the one who manifests and clarifies destinies. Move in this place, the one who redi redirects individuals that are lost. Move in this place, the one who is the light, who gives Agegrita, Handekesha, who gives the Hayabosita, who gives Inderebosita, who gives guidance to those who are lost like a GPS. <laughs> 
in a car like a GPS with a person holds and walks if they're in a strange place. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that your surroundings might seem strange, that you might feel so disorientated because of COVID-19. Maybe you might be feeling under pressure because of family dynamics. Maybe you are feeling under pressure because of the Kabrome, the climate of your industry. Whatever your condition, we know one who says, I will shepherd you. We know one who says, I will pick you up from where you are and take you to where I want you to be. We know one who says, my word will not fail you. We are in his presence today. I love what Romans chapter 4 verse 17 says, in the presence of God. God who calls things that are not. How does he call it? He reveals it through his word. How does he do that? We have the spirit of God on the inside. That's the promise that God gave to each and every one of his child. He says, I will give you the Holy Spirit. We know it happened. We read the history and in our Bible. We know in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says you would be present to empower so we are effective wherever we are planted. Then we know in Acts chapter 2 it happened as prophesied by prophets in the past. So we see on the day of Pentecost when there were various Jews who were devout, who were religious, they were all coming together on that pilgrimage coming together to a physical temple but they did not know that things were changing. I'm here to tell you child of God, the church of the 21st century, the church of God the called ones and sent out ones, called ones, empowered sent out ones, we know that in this age, in this day empowered by the Holy Spirit we are able to speak of God's wonderful works that we experience through our own personal lives, wherever we are, in the mighty name of Jesus. If you believe that you are born again and you are sanctified by the precious blood of Jesus, if you believe that, just say hallelujah where you are. If you believe that, you are seated with Christ Jesus, seated with him, far above all titles that are given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Say hallelujah. If you believe that you are in a good place, in the presence of God, where you can torment evil spirits, where you can torment demons, say hallelujah. If you are believing that greater is he that resides in you, that tabernacles in you, that lives in you, that anything that can come against you, that anything that is in the world, say hallelujah. If you believe Christ in you, is indeed the hope of glory. Say hallelujah. If you believe he is your shepherd to shield, to protect, and to guide you, say hallelujah. If you believe that as you wait on his word, let his word determine your destiny. Let his word determine your expectation. Let his word determine your hope. If you believe that you won't be disappointed because he cannot fail, say hallelujah. If you are fully persuaded that the one who promised, who is ever watching over his word, to perform it. He's not only watching you to protect you. He's not only watching you to provide for you. He's watching over every word that he has given us to perform it. And he says in his word, nothing is impossible with me. In some translation in Luke chapter 137, they say, the God's word cannot fail. In Isaiah 55, it tells us to listen to him therefore. So tonight in the name of Jesus, we will be listening to God. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. As a humble servant, I come before the throne of God with you. I humble myself before him. I trust that he has a word for somebody out there. I trust that he has power to heal cancer. He has power to heal tuberculosis, power to heal any embracica, any ailment with a name because he told me in his word. He's above every title. He's above every name. I believe in the name of Jesus. Anything that has been named by a human being, any sickness that has been the robot discovered by a human being, any plague, any Roma virus that has been discovered by the Brosikaya with the name. I believe God is above it. I believe if He wills in this place, in this platform, if you will stretch out and say, Father, I cry and I call on you, He will answer and you will not suffer shame. I'm just gonna read this psalm that I wanted us to read today as we start this continue with the session. I welcome each and every one of you in the mighty name of Jesus. Psalm 123. Unto you I lift up my eyes. We are lifting up our eyes unto Yahweh. We are lifting up our eyes unto God Almighty. We are lifting up our eyes unto the Bresikaya, unto the God Bresikababai, unto the God of the Bible. 
He is the only true God and there is none like him. We worship him, we trust in him, we depend on him. I do. And he's been faithful in my life. I'm going to testify later. But for now, I just want us to read and agree. Stand with the psalmist. Agree with the psalmist and say, I also in my room, I also in my home, I also in the comfort of my lounge, I also in my car, whatever gadget you are using, I also lift up my eyes, not to a pastor today, not responding to an altar call somewhere. I lift up my eyes to God Almighty, verse 1, unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Oh, glory to God, he created the heavens, he created the earth. By his powerful word, he is worthy to be worshipped. He is worthy to be praised. And I can with confidence, I can with faith, no, I lift up my, say, my eyes to somebody who is dependable. His nature, his character has been revealed to a certain season. In a certain season in my life, his nature, his character has been revealed to some of you in your life. You've experienced him. You have seen his faithfulness. And as we read the Bible, we see his faith in many incidences, in many accounts, he is faithful then, he will be faithful today and so you can lift up your eyes to God, I know people that have lifted up their eyes to created beings and been disappointed I know people that carry wounds, they have scars, because they've lifted their eyes to servants, to bosses, to, to subordinates, to anybody, to bankers, to bank managers to financiers, lifted their eyes to government officials, lifted their eyes to different people with different offices at different platforms they've been disappointed by if you lift your eyes to the lord and i love the one in psalm 121 the one before he says i lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come from my help comes from the lord hallelujah i'm able to say why so downcast oh my soul trust in the lord your god as you lift up your eyes i'm saying that to somebody why are you so downcast? Why are you so discouraged? I want to encourage you to trust in the Lord your God, to have hope in Him, to believe in Him, find confidence in Him. He is a stable, solid foundation. He's an anchor that holds. No matter how stormy it is, He's faithful to His word. And so He says, I lift up my eyes to the Lord. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord in Psalm 20, 121. Back to the Psalm I was at. Psalm 123. Behold, the eyes, behold, as the eyes of the Lord look at the hand of their master, and the eyes of the maid at the hands of the mistress. Sorry, I'm just going to stop this. And the eyes of the maid at the hands of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he is gracious and favorable towards us. I want to encourage people here. You've had that feeling. Some of you have been in boardrooms where you wanted to get leave. Maybe some of you have been at a bank where you wanted to get a loan. And as you walked there, you walked with a petition. You walked with a cry. You walked with a request and you made that request. Oftentimes you look at your credit rating or, or at times you look at your relationship with the boss or with the financier or with any other stakeholder you're running an NPO and a non-profit making organization or whatever, maybe a friend, a wife that you want to get favor from and you know they have the resource you need and as you walk to them, you look up to them in anticipation of receiving it. You try everything you can to ensure they give it to you and this illustration is saying as a maid looks towards a mistress or as a servant looks towards a master so I come to you I lift my eyes to you I come and cry to you I call upon you if we can do it to human leaders if we can do it to created beings why can't we do it to God? If we can do that business proposal, take time to make it, pay finances to make it look presentable, to make them know are we sincere, how serious we are with the project. If we can do that and God watching, God seeing us. Remember we said God neither sleeps, the one who watches us neither sleeps or slumbers. He's watching us 24-7, watching us to protect, to guide, to shield, watching us so that he can perform his word. He's watching over his word. Remember 
remember he's watching. He sees our reaction, our response in situations where we need help. He sees where we cry to. And he's saying here through the psalmist, cry to the Lord. I lift my eyes to the Lord. I want to encourage somebody out there. You've gone everywhere. You've talked about your problem. You've approached everybody. But you haven't gone to God's throne and literally cried as much as you have cried to everyone around your commune or everyone around your home, everyone around your family. Go before God and take him as serious as you've taken the bank manager when you wanted a loan. As serious as you've taken uh, the person that you are asking. And some of the things I'm going to speak are going to be specific to the people here. Because I'm trusting God, prophetic grace, the spirit of God on the inside to identify specific situations so that it will be so relevant to you. If you drop your jaw and wonder how I knew it, I didn't know it. The Holy Spirit knows everything and he is here and I'm believing he's inspiring and he's guiding me. And some of those people, you want a plan done for your building, a plan done for that business project. And you're looking for an architecture, you're looking for a quantity surveyor to help you do that and draft that. You're asking everybody, you're saying, come on, I'm starting. I don't have resources. Please help. But you haven't taken your plan and laid it bare before God and cried and called on him. I'm telling somebody out there that the psalmist in Psalm 24 says, I cried out to the Lord. I lifted my eyes to God. Psalm, sorry, Psalm 123, sorry. Unto you I lift up my eyes. O you enthroned in the heavens. Behold. I want to cross-reference with... Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. I love that because it's so simple, straightforward. It says, approach God's throne boldly. And some of you are, are failing to do so because you think you are not worthy to stand before the presence of God. If you read about men of God in the Old Testament, oftentimes they would say prophets who had an anointing for the office would come before a king who also had an authority and an anointing for the office. But the prophets would come and stand on this, particularly during the time when the leaders of Israel were uh, sinning, they were doing wrong, they were not violating the laws of the covenant. So they would have a mouthpiece of God who would speak. Oftentimes they would say, I stand before God. I stand before God. So they would say they have the grace to be able to stand and hear the word of God and come as representatives of God as they speak into the king. And I'm saying to you, you too can stand before God, not by your might, not by your power, not by your own righteousness. You can stand before God right now as the New Testament church because of the finished work of the cross. Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, who never sinned, was hung on the cross. He stayed on the cross on purpose because he had you in mind. He knew you were failing dismally. He knew that you could never keep his righteous standard as set in the Bible. Nobody can. But he did. When he did it, he got what you deserve right now. He got death. He got rejected. And Jesus Christ, as he says, Father, Father, why have thou forsaken me? Gives up his ghost. You, child of God, your sins were totally discharged on that cross. The wrath of God, the anger of God against injustice, against your sin, was turned directly to his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that you and I, if we believe, will have eternal life. He did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that we can be saved. Now that we are saved, it doesn't, doesn't end there as saved individuals transferred into the kingdom of Jesus Christ he transferred us delivered us from the dominion of darkness dominion of darkness darkness must not have dominion over us as the light of God shines in and through our lives we displace darkness I wanted to explain that so that you have an understanding of that theology so right now we each and every one of us are operating in the kingdom of Jesus Christ he is king he is king. He has dominion and he wants to resikaya. He wants to extend that influence through you and I. As children of God, our bodies belong to him. The Bible tells us that he's done so much for us. He's paid that price for us. We are no longer our own. It's okay. I know you want to stop only hold on to your life. Stop only hold on to your things. They are not yours anyway. The earth is the Lord and everything in it. Once you begin to realize that you belong to him, you are treasured and valuable to him. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen race. You belong to God. You are owned by God. 
and he takes ownership of you trust me he is responsible to take care of you that is why he's watching over you as the apple of his eye i did that to illustrate that when i touch the pupil of my eye all of a sudden instinctively i guard it i protect it i want you to imagine an enemy trying to touch the pupil of god's eye trying to touch the apple of god's eye don't touch the lord's anointed through us in the name of jesus nations have hope but we need to know our position in christ jesus we need to know where we operate from because outside there people will label you outside there people will treat you with contempt outside there people will judge you based on material stuff judge you based on pigmentation of skin judge you based on ethnic group that's a mistake they make because god doesn't judge as man judges god doesn't see as man sees when god looks at us what he sees is the precious blood of his son jesus he loves his son so much and he loves his church he loves each and every one of us that calls he calls he calls us sons he's given us a spirit that is a constant reminder of the devil when we say abba satan can't say that enemy brusica those that don't know god jesus christ as lord and savior can't say that and so right now in the name of jesus the way you have cried to created beings for help and being disappointed and now you look at psalms some of these psalms are psalms of lamentation and as you read some of these psalms of a cry of a person experiencing a different situation i tell you when you look into this you will find something that mirrors your situation luther said martin luther stated that when i look into the psalms i see a mirror of my own situation i'm paraphrasing his quote he said that that's how i feel when i look even calvin said something similar to that you know some of the early church fathers they were saying when i look into the psalm i see a reflection of the life that i feel some of the incidents that i go through when i look into the psalm read through the psalms from the beginning to psalm 150 you will see certain situations particularly the psalms of lament where they are crying in remorse, in grief, in pain, in hurt. But you see it, a particular form. They go out there, they make a cry to God. After they make that cry to God, they make a confession, a statement of what God says, what the will of God is. Then they make a petition to God and say, God, this is my request. And afterwards, they normally would make a vow of praise that God, if that request is granted, this is what I will do. When I begin to look at that form, I think that's what we should do when we go before God. Not cry to men, you'll be disappointed. You'll hate your brother, you'll hate your sister because you are asking from somebody who's not the source of all things. The father, source. You know, the root word for father in Greek is source. So we need to go to the source and the sustainer of it all. And he wants you to come to him. That's why he says you are qualified. Not by your might, not by your righteousness. To cry and call on him. Like the psalmist says, I cry to the Lord. I call to the Lord. And I want us this evening to have an opportunity to do just that. Cry to the Lord and call on him. And as you call on him, I want you to be expected as a servant. Expect the master to give. And in, during the time, particularly during the Roman Empire in the New Testament, you know, when you're reading New Testament accounts, you know, the Roman Empire, it was popular to have servants in household. Someone was saying almost a third of the population were, were servants. And so it is when Paul begins to use the word that I'm a born servant of Christ, he's trying to explain that these people were used to totally depend. Some of them, after they had served their time as servants, they would come to their master because the master was good, the master had a good character, the master had, was wealthy, the master could take care of them. They would say to the master, me and my family pledge to serve you, willing, voluntary. And they would put a, a symbol, maybe put a little ear, earring that would tell everybody that I am that person's servant. And so each time you read that, and I read this and say, this example, as a servant, looks towards its master, knowing my master is faithful, knowing my master is able, knowing my master is well supplied, knowing my master can take good care of me, seeing my master's faithfulness, I look up to that master expecting. And who's our master? The Bible says, whatever we do, we do it as unto the Lord, because it is the Lord that we are serving. The Bible tells us we've been transferred into his kingdom. The Bible tells us that he is our Lord, he is our Savior, he is our Shepherd, he is our Guide. So we look up to him, expecting him, not the presidents of the land that have failed people 
dismally. We look and expect from him, not the economies of the world that have crumbled many times. We look up to him, not men that have made promises and broken their promises. And I don't blame them. They can't keep some of the promises. Someone employs you and tells you, I'm going to give you an increment at the end of the year. And the company doesn't do well. The bottom line goes to the red. And they tell you that because, because of circumstances beyond our control, we've got to let you go. Then you get disappointed. You cry. You can do it well. But then they come in and tell you there's nothing we can do. These are macroeconomic conditions. They are, the way they are cause of COVID-19. Not our master God. God, not our creator of the universe. There is nothing beyond his control. He is able to do as he pleases. He is sovereign. He is mighty. His word tells us what he wants to do. And his word guarantees us that it won't fail. The word expresses his will. The word expresses what he wants to do. The word expresses what his desires are. And he says in his word, my word won't return void. And my word will accomplish that which I please. Just like when it rains or snows. And so tonight... As we read this psalm, we are reminded, we're lifting our eyes to the one and only. The one that is uncomparable. The one that they call Manderebo Sikam. That when you, you read the Bible, they call him Elohim, transcended. He's, he's separate from us. He's not like us. He's so different, distinct, yet at the same time, in relationship with him, we can call him with that covenant name and say Yahweh. And today in the 21st century, we can say Abba. Father, that term of endearment to this day, Jews are afraid to call God Father. They are so holy, so transcendent, but to us who are in communion with him, thank God for what Jesus Christ did on the cross. We can run at, on his lap, know that he wants us, know that he loves us, know that he affirms us, know that he tells us what he thinks about us in his word, believing every word he says about us. This morning as I woke up, I said, God, I want to experience that love as Paul was praying for the church. If you could just experience his love, his depth, his width, we need to experience it and we experience it through life. Yes, with the problems we face, with the challenges we face, they give opportunities to experience the love of God. I've been, I've been a parent. And you know, there's, you, you, love is something, you can't do it in a vacuum, you can't do it alone. You have to do it in relationship. You can't say, I'm, just, I'm full of love, I'm just love. You, you, you've got to exercise it as you relate, as you engage people. And as we engage in process of time, we measure time, day, we measure time, hours. As we engage, yes, we meet struggles, we meet challenges and through that process people begin to see expressions of love and some of them might not understand it but some of them might not see it some of them might doubt it and when they doubt it they relate with you and tell you that ah, i don't see your love show me your love the good thing about time god put us here in time and space to express love to us and his faithfulness has been seen and we've experienced that love and paul was praying for the church in ephesus I want you to experience it. He ain't seen nothing yet. There's more to that. God shows his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God shows his love for us in that he created the universe. As beautiful as it is, planted us here. When you look at it, we don't fully understand everything. It's almost like a big baby cot. You know, when someone's going to have a child and they buy this beautiful baby cot and they say, I, my child, my color scheme is blue. Look at my baby. But God created the whole world and put us right there. And he gave us a way to live, a direction and guidance. He loves us. He wants to express love. And how do you see it when you're a parent? It's easy. A kid comes from school and you're a parent and the kid says, Daddy, they're bullying me at school. What do you do with the kid? If you are a, a, a good dad, if you are a good mom or a guardian, whoever you are, you say, come here. What happened? What, what, what happened? You, you're having communion. You're relating. You, you, you're stooping to the level of the kid. And some of us speak baby language. You say, what happened? You don't use that jargon you're using in the office, the accounting jargon or the engineering jargon. No, 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 no. You come to the child's level. You love the child. Then you draw the child near. You try to empower the child. And in some cases, when you find the child is not strong enough to handle the situation, you walk with the child. You say, tomorrow I'm going there to school. I want to see those boys. Or first you go to see the headmistress. You see some, but you sort that thing out. The kid comes to you in expectation most kids until we fail them many times always run to their dad or their mom and that is why when paul says we've been given a spirit by which we cry daddy by which we cry to the person who has all power who has all authority we call on him 
as a servant looks up towards a master, as a, servant, a, 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 a lady will look up towards a mistress, we must do the same towards God. Because God wants to reveal himself to you in scripture. God wants to reveal his faithfulness to you. So that he will be your first point of call. Before you go to that bank for that loan, you go to God. Before you go and see that friend for that loan, go to God. Before you, you take that plan and start executing that plan, go to God. If you read some Psalms, then go to Psalm 127, just as a cross reference to what I'm saying, because I read these Psalms over and over again, and I'm just going to, Psalm 127, the Psalm says, unless the Lord, this is Solomon, uh, he, who pens this Psalm apparently. And so Solomon says, this guy is wealthy. Solomon was wealthy, he knew his dad, his dad was wealthy, King David. And Solomon, he, he had asked for wisdom to administrate the affairs that God had given him, to, uh, to steward what God had put in his hand. Solomon says this. He did not depend on his money, he did not depend on his wealth, he did not depend on the inheritance he got from his father, who was King David. Solomon says, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain that build it. It's not about me. It's about depending on the one who I look up to, God. And some of us, because of our bank account, some of us, because of our net worth, we begin to say we do things our way. Remember Saul's attitude when the prophet comes and tries to warn him, he says, listen, I do it my way. I'm paraphrasing his text. He thought it was okay to do, to keep stuff that God had said, get rid of. So he says, tell him a mouthpiece of God, I saw it better to do it this way. He's not doing things that are good in his own eyes. Remember, you've got to do things that are good in God's eyes. Where do you get that instruction? You get it from the word. The will of God expresses what's good in God's eyes. And so in this case, I want to encourage each and every person out there to say in the name of Jesus, like Solomon, I know unless the Lord builds a house, I labor in vain when I'm building. Nothing I build will be substantial because God tells unless the Lord guards a city, the watchman stands in vain. In vain you rise up early in the morning. How many people are laboriously doing stuff, seeking after people, knocking at doors, but they seem to be going nowhere. There's no progress. There's no change. Did you consult God? Did you lift up your eyes to God? Are you totally dependent and reliant on God? My favorite proverb, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Depend on Him. Trust Him. Have confidence in Him with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. And so here Solomon later on in another psalm, he's telling us, unless the Lord, we got to depend on the Lord. And so he continues. Verse 1. Verse 2. Behold, I'm in verse 3 now. This is his petition. Be gracious to us, O Lord. Be gracious and faithful. I identify with this and I want you to see you will laugh because it's so so popular this kind of cry it says be gracious to us O Lord be gracious and favorable towards us for we great we are greatly filled with contempt our soul is greatly filled with scoffing from those who are at ease and the contempt of the proud who disregard God's law that should not be Child of God, blood washed, sanctified by the precious blood of the Lamb, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the Word of God, and calling on God, and God doesn't answer. The psalmist is saying, people that don't obey the law of God, people that don't fear God, are looking at them with contempt. And that's not, that God knows that for His, and I'm saying this deliberately, for His kingdom's sake, for His name's sake. God doesn't want people to look at Him and say He is an absentee father. God doesn't want people to look at your situation and say he is an irresponsible shepherd. No, no, that's not his nature. God is faithful, the Bible says, even if we are unfaithful. God remains faithful and true to who he is. He doesn't change. The psalmist here is saying, and I love this, you're coming before your father and saying, oh, but dad, if people see me in school and my, schools, my fees are not paid, and, then, and if people see how my food and not paid, then what are they going to say about you? Or, oh, oh God, if, if people see me at school coming with such a uniform, what are they going to say about you? This is exactly what he is saying, and I'm putting it in a context that's easy to understand. If people see me struggle with my bills, what are they going to say about you? If people see me struggle, you know, malnutrition or begging for bread, what, what, what would they say about you? And, and this psalmist is saying, God, I come to you. I lift up my eyes to you. I'm totally dependent on you. I'm totally reliant on you. This is my petition. Be gracious to me. Abundantly gracious to me because people that don't revere you, that don't know you, when they look at me, they treat me with content that should not be. And I'm praying for each and every person out there 
who's faithfully standing on God's word, faithfully trusting in God. And in your workplace, you are ostracized and people know you always call on the name of the Lord. Somehow you are waiting and trusting God for providence. And you are saying, God, will you fail me? I want you to know God will never fail you. God is faithful to his word in the mighty name of Jesus. Right now, I believe angels have been assigned to minister to every need on this platform. But my question is, have you done what the psalmist did? Have you cried? Have you directed your attention on God? Are you fixing your eyes on Jesus? Like Peter walked on water, yes. When he walked, he did fall. He did start sinking. But glory to God, his cry was heard. He said, Lord, save me. The Lord was faithful. He saved him. Maybe you're sinking right now. Maybe you've been waiting. And you're saying, Lord God, I want to keep my eyes stayed on you so that I am in perfect peace. You're saying, Lord, I want to fix my eyes on you, the author and the fixer, finisher of my faith. You are looking right now and feeling exhausted. Some of you are exhausted. You've been doing the same things like monotony now. Monotonous. You come before God. But I want you to know the Bible tells us in Hebrews, come before his throne. It doesn't say maybe you will receive help. It doesn't say maybe you will receive mercy. It's a guarantee. It's saying when you come before God and you cry to God, you will receive help. And the word help encompasses whatever help is needed on this platform. And mercy, I oh, love that. Instead of judgment, you could have said judgment, but mercy is a legal term. Have mercy, your highness. There are mitigating circumstances. I hear some people cry as an advocate. A lawyer stands up and says, don't worry, I know the law. I Don't worry, I know the constitution of this land. Don't worry, I will represent you. You just shut your mouth and be still. Then he stands up and says, your majesty, have mercy. He deserves it, yes. He, he Have mercy. And guess who is your advocate? I believe right now on the throne room of heaven, Jesus Christ seated on his throne. You know what he's doing? <laughs> he's not only ruling and reigning as the head of the church, but he's interceding on your behalf. Oh, hallelujah. He's interceding on my behalf. What is he saying? I can just imagine. When I look at scripture, I get to know what he would say. I went down to earth to destroy the works of the evil one. I went down here to earth Mandereba, to empower him. I went down on earth to be able to release the Holy Spirit after having died and resurrected and ascended on high. I went down on earth to ensure that he's blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I've prayed for all his sin. He's acquitted and he should be free. Therefore, you can show favor upon their lives irrespective of what Satan says, the accuser of the brethren. You can receive the favor of God right now without God reneging on his word or his righteousness. So the righteous God can look down and say, my requirement has been fully met in Jesus Christ. Therefore, as I look at my family, as I hear the cry of my child, I'm able to release what I want to release in his life. In the name of Jesus. Because I loved him anyway. But I couldn't show favor in him because of that barrier. But glory to God, we've been reconciled to God because of the precious blood of the Lamb. And right now, before God, we stand boldly. I can imagine how the, precious, the prodigal son acted like. Just try and renect re re that scene. He goes around, takes half of his inheritance, wastes it. And then he's coming back. I just imagine how he comes back, all shy, feeling so bad, feeling so useless. And then all of a sudden, he finds the father running toward him and then the father embracing him and the father showing so much love and so much mercy and the father saying come on everybody he's back kill a calf let's celebrate imagine the son who's been there all along looking at such favor looking at such showering of love he, imagine how you would feel you don't have to imagine he gets irritated, he gets frustrated, he says, I've been here all along, but this guy goes, the son of yours, the son of yours, you know, he, he wastes his life in riotous living, he comes back, but you embrace him, child of God, I want you to know, that is what God wants to do with each and every one of us today, that's why he wants you to lift up your eyes towards him, that is why he wants you to fix your eyes, because he doesn't want to share his glory with anyone, he doesn't want you to go around saying, listen man, I've got great credentials, I deserve this. He doesn't want you to say, listen, uh, you know, I've got a great wealthy network. That's why I get this. He, he doesn't want you to accord that to anything because that then becomes an idol. That then takes his place. He wants you to be able to say, you know what? I'm totally dependent on God Almighty. He is my source. 
I know the earth is the Lord's and all in it is his. I know he's given me stewardship of what I have. Stewardship of the tangible and intangible. Stuff that you don't see of that vision, that dream that he has given you. He has given you the responsibility to steward it, to nature it and make sure it translates from just a picture that's in your heart to become something tangible that gives people employment. Tangible that brings solutions to social ills in our community. To something tangible. He's depended on you to steward it. And as he steward it, he's saying to you, come to me, trust in me for provi provision, for everything you need. Come to me in Jesus' language. If you believe me, you will do great works. Greater works than this that I'm doing. This is just a demonstration. But you guys, you're going to do great works. Listen, if you need anything as you do great works, ask me. Ask anything in my name. I will give it to you. What is mine belongs to the Father. What is the Father's? It's mine. He's doing it in his humanity as an example. After having de demonstrated that everything belongs to him, he did it many times. He showed many signs that he was above all the elements. He was above even death. He was a Lord over all that. And then he tells people that he's assigning, passing the baton to, giving responsibility to the disciples. And the disciples preach that word and they do their vision. That John chapter 14 from verse 12 to 14, it actually did happen. Great works were done by them. Handkerchiefs were healing people. Shadows were healing people. They went about ministering to people. There was no problem or lack of substance or provision. They were asking in service, doing what God had told them to do in the name of Jesus, representing him. Today, we need to be able to exercise those principles we see. Go and call upon him like Peter called upon him. Call upon him like the disciples would in different incidents. When they would try and fail, they say, Jesus, we tried. Why did we fail? It was a coaching and mentorshiping experience they were having daily. He was walking alongside with them. Today, thank God, he's not limited to a geographical location. Thank God, he's walking in your room. He's walking alongside with you through his spirit, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the comforter, the enabler, the one that empowers you. A deposit that guarantees that everything God promised in his word is coming in the name of Jesus. He guarantees that it's a seal that says sorted, approved. And as you stand right now looking up to the Lord, be expectant today. Father God, we thank you tonight. I thank you, Father, for the word that I shared. I wanted to share a couple of Psalms. I wanted to, to make declarations from Psalm 91. There was so much in my heart. But Father, I believe I did what you saw fit to be done tonight. I pray for each and every person that is connected today, whatever situation they are going through. I know, Father, we probably trusted in created beings and being disappointed instead of trusting in you. Trusted in created beings for our provision. Trusted in created beings for our protection. Trusted in created beings for everything else that we should totally rely and depend on you. I thank you, Lord God, that in your sovereignty, you use what you created to meet your divine purposes. We see you in scripture do that. And as you speak of your sovereignty in Isaiah chapter 43 and 46, you speak how you can make things move and shift things to fulfill your divine purpose. And I love how Job says it in Job 42. Nobody can thwart God's purposes. May we understand that. I thank you that you've revealed your purposes in your word. May we hold on to them. And Father, when we approach your throne, as you say in Hebrews 4, verse 6, may we expect to get mercy, to get by help. Thank you for the help that you've provided to each and every person. If you're on this platform, there's anything that you were concerned about, worried about, anxious about, can you try and make it a prayer point? I'll give you an example. Maybe you were worried about bro, payment of fees for your child at school. Payment for a, a bond, a mortgage, or payment for rent. It was stressing you, worrying you. Turn it into a prayer point. Say, Lord God, I take those bills. I bring them to you. I thank you for the ability to be able to honor those bills. I thank you for the supernatural grace to be able to have the resource, revenue streams to pay it. I thank you for favor in dealing with it. Let me give you one case. Uh, they had to pay temple tax and they came over and said we've got to pay temple tax and Jesus Christ just comes and says go catch a fish 
and pull out that coin and go pay tax. Funny, the scripture doesn't tell us he asked how much is the temple tax. The scripture just tells us that he says, I want to pay what belongs to Caesar. I want to give it to him. And he says, supernaturally, he provides and meets that need. When the disciples were, had been fishing all night and caught nothing, he comes to them and says, launch to the deep, cast your net. And they caught a boat sinking, almost net breaking catch. They are out in the field. They are out in the marketplace, so to say. They are working. They need revenue. They need resources. Jesus speaks to the mundane, ordinary tasks, but under the instruction of a divine decisia, of a divine command, and there is total change and provision. I pray in the name of Jesus that every need is being met right now. If there's anybody sick that is not well in their body, organ issues, if your organs have issues, maybe it's the heart, kidney, lung, pancreas, whatever it is, your, your brisica, blood pressure issues, whether it's low blood pressure or high blood pressure, we need to start trusting that God is able to heal. Just one other illustration. You know, the first miracle of the wedding in Cana, he speaks and says, take those water pots and take the wine to the, the ribosia, the master of the feast. Taste it. He says, shocked. We normally leave, you know, you've left the best for last. And that's because God's hand is in it. No man can make wine like God can. He does it miraculously. I'm telling you the level of excellence, the fit and the robo the level of excellence of your work ethic as you take it to God. There's some people that are working, you're on a project and you're saying, God, I just want to do this project well. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 3, the Bible says Daniel had an excellent spirit when he delivered his work. There was such a resitia, the element of God's prositia, yes, yeah, glory in his higher in that project, an assignment. You're writing an assignment. Students who are writing assignments, people that are doing their PhD thesis, thesis, we're doing masters, whatever it is, in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for that grace that was upon Daniel and his friends. The Bible says to these young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all the kind of literature they were doing. And God gave them the grace to be 10 times better than all the other contemporaries. I tried to do him imagine what that meant, but I saw it in students that took sticky hand, stood on that word and became on Dean's list. They became recognized in industries. There are some right now that are being recognized in industries that are full of people with different worldviews, but God is separating them from average and making them shine for his own glory. And pray for this person that is Zikom Resitare for your favor in the mighty name of Jesus. Because of time, I have to stop. I'm sure it's past time. I was meant to finish it. Gora 2. I was meant to finish it for Gora 2. Thank you so much for joining. And may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. Thanks once again to Pastor Lionel and the Triumphant Christian Church. I pray that God will bless you all abundantly. May God supply all your needs. Be expectant. God is going to cause serious breakthroughs in your life. I want you to acknowledge it and I want you to thank God for it. What I wanted us to do was, if there was time, we were going to go to Psalm 136, where he says, thanks be to God, and then a testimony comes afterwards. He says, thanks be to God, then a testimony comes, what God had done. And they were speaking it on the context of Israel as a nation. So they were saying, he parted the Red Sea, he, he, uh, he destroyed the army of Egypt, he, and, and you need to do that also. You know, like expect, you're looking up in expectation, you trust God, you make your petition, you make your request, and you, they made a vow of praise that God, if you do this, I'm going to worship you, and we do that in our real life. We say, God, if you just give me this job, I promise you I'll be in church every Sunday, I promise you I'll be a giver in church. But when that happens, unfortunately, we don't do that. That's why we plateau and begin to start falling. What's important is know what got you there. Know those principles. Stick by them. Be faithful to them. So when you get to your so-called Canaan promised land, you're living in houses you never built, drinking from wells you never drank, yet don't get caught up by the sophistication of the culture, by the wealth and the opulence, then you begin to conform to the standards of Canaan. No, no, no. You need to continue exercising the principles that you learned in the wilderness, the principles that you learned with God's presence in your life and then you keep growing exponentially and your graph won't go down. You keep growing from glory to glory to glory. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for your time. Blessings.